Hi, I'm the History Guy, and if you didn't know, in addition to our channel on YouTube, we also have a page on Patreon, where for just a few dollars a month, you can continue to support the work we do here at the History Guy, and one of the things that you get for being a patron on Patreon is that we produce one extra episode a month that is exclusive for our patrons on Patreon, and occasionally, like today, when we're on vacation, we're able to bring one of those episodes to the YouTube audience. So today, I'm proud to bring to you the second in a series of travel logs that I did this summer, covering the trip that I took to visit the Tank Museum in Dorset. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you do, please consider becoming a patron. Back in July, I was offered the extraordinary opportunity to visit the world-famous Tank Museum in Dorset, film an episode of their series Top 5 Tanks. That episode's been posted. If you haven't seen it, head on over to their channel and check it out. But the invitation also gave me an excuse to collect up a couple of friends who are also history buffs and check out some of the many historical sites in southern Wales and south-central England. We had a great time at the Tank Museum, but still had a couple of days in Wales and all sorts of choices of places to visit on the way back to Cardiff. We decided to stop in the town of Glastonbury in Somerset, south of Bristol. Glastonbury is located on a dry point surrounded by what is called the Somerset Levels, a coastal plain that around the 7th millennium BC was flooded as sea levels rose. As a result, prehistoric people started to populate the area, building one of the earliest engineered roads. There's evidence of settlement in the area from as early as the Mesolithic period up through the Iron Age. The town itself is old enough that there is not a clear record of how it got its name, although some history suggests the name may be derived from a man supposedly resurrected by St. Patrick. In any case, the last part of the name, Bury, is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word Burg, which in this case actually referred to a monastic enclosure. The monastic connection in Glastonbury actually goes back by legend to Joseph of Arimathea, who supposedly brought the Holy Grail to Glastonbury in the first century, making a part of the King Arthur legend. While this story may be just fancy, it is clear that there was a religious occupation in Glastonbury in the Romano-British times, and King Inne of Wessex gave an endowment to the community of monks there in the early 8th century, directing them to build a stone church that would become the magnificent Glastonbury Abbey. The abbey was enlarged in the 10th century under the abbot St. Dunstan, who instituted Benedictine rule at the abbey. The abbey became large and wealthy, but was stripped of its wealth during the dissolution of the monasteries by Henry VIII in the 16th century. The abbot at the time, Henry Whiting, resisted the action and was hanged, drawn, and quartered as a traitor to the crown. The abbey fell into ruin as its stones were taken for other buildings. Today the ruins are managed by a truss and are absolutely spectacular to see. The sheer scale of the ruins shows how large and wealthy the monastery must have been at its height. The best preserved of the buildings is the abbot's kitchen, which is described as one of the best preserved medieval kitchens in Europe. One of the surprises that you'll see is the mark grave of King Arthur. In the 12th century, the abbot, Henry de Sully, commissioned a search, and in the graveyard, a grave was discovered with a hollowed oaken trunk that contained two skeletons and a leaden cross with the Latin inscription, Hegeket Sepultus, Incletus Rex Arturus in Insula Avalonia, meaning, here lies interred the famous King Arthur on the Isle of Avalon. But before you get too excited, historians generally discount the story as simply a ruse to draw more tourists to make a pilgrimage to the abbey. The discovery was also followed by discoveries of the graves of St. Patrick and St. Dunstan, claims which have also been discounted. In south-central England, the grave of King Arthur is more or less the English version of George Washington slept here, and there are multiple sites that make the claim. But still, no fan of Arthurian legends should miss the opportunity to visit Glastonbury. Near the town is Glastonbury Tor, a large hill outside of town that is not overly long, but a fairly steep climb up a set of stairs that did cause a fat history guy to breathe a bit heavy, but was even harder on my friend, whose nine-year-old son forgot his sunglasses on top, forcing him to make the climb twice in order to retrieve them. The view is spectacular, and you can really see how green the countryside is. You can imagine on a foggy day that would seem like you're hanging out in the heavens. There's a tower on top of the tour called St. Michael's Tower, which was once part of a church built here and was the site of where Henry Whiting was executed. The church was demolished except for the tower, which fell into ruin after the abbey was abandoned, but it is still impressive. The tour is also connected to Arthurian legends. Some medieval historians describe the tour as the location of Arthur's Avalon and suggest that the St. Michael's Tower might have been the location where the Holy Grail was kept. We had time for lunch in Glastonbury, where we had the traditional food of the area, the Cornish pasty. A pasty has meat and potatoes inside a round shortbread crust that is crimped and baked. Restaurants today sell many varieties, although the traditional recipe uses minced beef, onion, potato, and turnip. Although the actual origin of the food is somewhat in dispute, it is the national dish of Cornwall in the southwest. Cornwall has a lot of tin and copper mines, and the pasty was seen as a good food for a miner, since it includes a full meal in one dish and, being relatively dense, holds heat well. 
There's a legend that the miners would hold the pasty along the crimped edge and leave that part uneaten, protecting the meal from the dirt on a miner's hands. An interesting thing about pasties is that they're also quite common in the Michigan Upper Peninsula, where the pasty is considered the official food of youpers. Pasties actually came to the UP in the 1800s, brought by Cornish immigrants who came to mine copper. You also find pasties in other places that had a good deal of Cornish immigration, including parts of Wisconsin, Montana, Pennsylvania, as well as locations in Mexico, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. So our stomachs full, we headed back into Wales and visited the St. Fagan's National Museum of History. Located on the former grounds of St. Fagan's Castle and Garden, a late 16th century manor house, the museum is called a People's Museum, and it is different than any other museum you've likely ever visited. It's an open-air museum that has moved or reconstructed dozens of historic buildings that represent how the Welsh people lived from the Iron Age up to modern times. You can look through this farmhouse as it appeared in 1800. This is the pigsty. Or these Iron Age roundhouses, or this castle for a Welsh prince. Many of these are original buildings that have been moved, while some are reconstructions based on archaeology. Many include local craftsmen using traditional methods. St. Tilio's church is rather amazing. Built in the 1200s, the church operated until it closed in 1973 and was moved and restored at the museum in 2007. While the building was empty, water seeped in and washed off layers of paint to reveal that the church had been brightly painted in the 16th century before Henry VIII's Protestant Reformation. This box contained the church valuables, had three locks because it was assumed that at least one of the three key holders would be honest, preventing theft. Ridi Ikar Terrace was also very interesting. These two-story row houses were built around 1800, were mainly used by miners, and were good quality when they were built. They remained occupied until 1979. The houses have been restored to represent the living conditions in different periods. The museum is far too large to see in a single day, and you can easily spend an hour in any one of the more than 50 buildings. It really is an extraordinary museum, and I hope to go back. Incidentally, this mailbox is out front of the museum. The red mailboxes are quite common in Great Britain, but many people don't even think about the royal cipher at the bottom, which represents the monarch at the time the box is made. Of course, most you see have the cipher of Elizabeth II, who's ruled since 1953, but we did see this box in London with her father George VI cipher. But this one at the museum, still a working mailbox, carried the cipher of Victoria, and it was made before 1901. It was the oldest one I saw on our trip. We had a couple days planned in London, but we had one more day in Wales, and that meant time for another castle. And this one was an interesting one. Castle Calk means the red castle, referring to the color of the stone. This castle, the mouth of the Taff Gorge, north of Cardiff, is a very fairy tale looking castle. It has tall towers topped with steep conical roofs. It has a drawbridge, a portcullis, and a courtyard very like what you'd see in a movie, or might actually have seen in a movie, as has been used as a set for movies like 1954's The Black Knight, starring Alan Ladd. But the thing is, Castle Cock looks much like a fairy tale castle because that is what it is. It is really a very large and ornate version of what is called a folly. A folly generally refers to a building built for decoration that is different than what it appears to be. In the Victorian era, it was not uncommon for a wealthy Victorian to build what appeared to be, for example, a bit of what was designed to look like a ruined Roman temple in their garden. Castle Cock might not technically be called a folly, since it was a functional manor house, but it would generally be described as that because it was not a medieval building at all, but a Victorian-era construction that represented the Victorian ideal of what a medieval castle should look like. Work on this medieval castle actually began in 1875. There was, apparently, an actual medieval fortification on the site, with parts possibly being built as early as 1081, that was abandoned sometime in the 14th century, likely having been damaged or destroyed in one of many Welsh rebellions. And there was an attempt to do archaeology, have the reconstruction match the original castle design. But Castle Cock is more fairly described as a fanciful Victorian manor house than an actual castle, and as such it represents the fabulous wealth and peculiar interest of John Patrick Crichton Stewart, the third Marquess of Butte. The peerage Marquess of Butte has an interesting history, and following it tells the story of the development of politics in the British Isles, at least back to the 13th century. Robert I of Scotland, popularly known as Robert the Bruce, led the Scottish War for Independence, was instrumental in gaining independence of Scotland as a country, and is revered as a national hero of Scotland. His son and successor, David II of Scotland, died without an heir in 1371, and so the crown went to Robert the Bruce's grandson, Robert II of Scotland who is the son of Robert the Bruce's daughter, Marjorie Bruce, and Walter Stewart, the High Steward of Scotland. 
Robert II formed the Royal House of Stuart, which would eventually rule both Scotland and then, after the accession of James VI in 1603, England until the 18th century. Robert II had many children, including an illegitimate son with his mistress, Moira Leitch, named John Stuart, who around 1400 was named Sheriff of Butte, which is an island in the estuary of the River Clyde on the west coast of Scotland. In 1627, the lands were made a baronetage. In 1703, the third baronet, Sir James Stuart, was made an earl. His grandson, John Stuart, the third Earl of Butte, became Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1762 during the reign of George III. Still with me? James Stuart had a son named John Stuart, born in 1744, who, as the heir to an earldom, went under the title Lord Mount Stuart, who, as you might say, married well. In 1766, he married a woman named Charlotte Windsor, in what you might think of as a marriage of convenience, given that she was referred to at the time as the rich, ugly Miss Windsor, even though there must have been some affection between them as they had nine children together. Charlotte Windsor had inherited the estate of her father, the second Viscount Windsor, and no, that's not the same family as the modern Windsors, who was wealthy not only because he too had married a wealthy heiress, but as descendants of the Herberts, the Earls of Pembroke, had also titled to vast lands in southern Wales. Thus, John Stuart became one of the largest landholders in Wales, and upon his father's death in 1792, became the Earl of Butte. And the two years later, the title was raised to Marquis, which is in the peerage above Earl but below Duke. Rich, ugly Charlotte Windsor died in 1800, and the Marquis married another heiress named Frances Coates, whose father had made a vast fortune in banking. John Stuart's son, also named John, born in 1767, used the name Lord Mount Stuart, and was a member of Parliament who married Lady Elizabeth McDowell Crichton, who was the only child of Patrick McDowell Crichton, the Earl of Dumfries. The marriage would add the name Crichton to further descendants, who would now be Crichton Stuarts, and ensure their children were the heirs of now three earldoms, Butte, Windsor, and Dumfries. John actually predeceased his father, and so it was his son, also named John, who, after the death of the first Marquess in 1814, inherited the title Second Marquess of Butte. John was fabulously wealthy, owned much of southern Wales, and was focused on developing business interests. Recognizing the huge mineral potential of coal and iron ore in southern Wales, he not only developed these interests on his own land, but built the Cardiff Docks, which allow much greater commercial exploitation of the resources. The second Marquess of Butte is generally referred to as the father of modern Cardiff. While building on his vast inherited fortune with new fortunes in iron and coal, he married Lady Maria North, who was the daughter of the Earl of Guildford, the son of the Prime Minister, and his wife, the daughter of the Earl of Buckinghamshire. Lady North brought a massive inheritance, but the union produced no children. Later, after Maria's death, Butte added even more lands and titles to the family by marrying Lady Sophia Rodden Hastings, the daughter of Francis Edward Rodden Hastings, the first Marquess of Hastings, and his wife, the Countess of Loudoun. The second Marquess died suddenly in 1848, leaving his vast estate, described as the greatest landholding and property rights of mid-19th century Britain, to he and Lady Sophia's six-month-old son, John Crichton Stuart, the third Marquess of Butte. When Crichton Stuart graduated Oxford, he was reputed to be the richest man in the world. In 1872, he married Gwendolyn Fitzalan Howard, the granddaughter of the Duke of Norfolk and the great-granddaughter of the Duke of Sutherland. By now, the family had married into so many important families amongst the British peerage that they could have fought the War of the Roses just amongst themselves. And it was this history that amassed the fortune that allowed the third Marquess to build a medieval castle in the 1870s as a vacation home, just for funsies. He was, at the same time, restoring the magnificent Cardiff Castle and transforming it into one of the most exquisite Victorian Gothic Revival mansions. Oddly, the Marquess was more interested in building projects than he was with completed ones, and after building Castle Cock, rarely spent any time here. Despite being an entire castle, it didn't have a lot of room for guests, but it does have representations of the coats of arms of the many houses that combined in the Butte family. The castle is a delightful example of Gothic revival, and also shows the Marquess, who was a pious convert to Catholicism, conservatism. For example, he had some of the nature-inspired panels in Lady Butte's bedroom altered because he thought the monkeys were depicted too scandalously. The castle was used by the military during the Second World War and was donated by the fifth Marquess to the state in 1950. It is now maintained by CADU, the Historic Environmental Service of the Welsh Government. 
Well, that's all the time for this travel log. Wales is an enchanting place. I really do hope to go back because there's so much more to see, but we had to get back to the United States, which means that we had to get back to London, where we would find Winston Churchill's chair and discover the proper way to size a hat. And we'll talk about that in the next travel log. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section and I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe. <laughs>